Welcome to Evidence Based, a new Harbinger Psychology podcast. I'm your host, Cassie Stossel. On today's episode, we're talking about worry. Our guest is Ben Eckstein, the author of Worrying is Optional. Ben is owner and director of Bull City Anxiety and OCD Treatment Center in Durham, North Carolina. He was trained at McLean's Hospital OCD Institute and has been specializing in the treatment of anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder for over a decade. He serves on the board of directors for OCD North Carolina and offers training, workshops, and speaking engagements in addition to his clinical work. Hi, Ben. Thanks so much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to talk about worry with you. I think it's such a relatable topic. A lot of us deal with it. And one thing I loved about your book is you really start out by talking about the difference between worry and worrying. So I I wanted to know if you could clarify the difference between the two for us. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, I, I think people often use these things sort of interchangeably. And I I do make a point of really digging into that in the book, because I think the difference is really, really important. Um, and so I think worry is just this thing that kind of shows up, you know, it's an unwanted thought, it's some concern that we have. You know, I, I sometimes kind of joke with people that, you know, I, I kind of hope that you have some worries, you know, that you have things that are meaningful and important in your life, things that you care about. But worrying the verb rather than the noun, you know, I think that that's more of this active process that we do. You know, so if worry is that initial thought, worrying is when we kind of pick up that thought and start to examine it and look at it and do something with it. You know, so it becomes this more volitional kind of intentional process. Yeah. And in your book, you say it may not always feel like it, but you're a participant and you have a role and that with worrying, we do have a say in it. Can you say more about that? Yeah. So I I think probably nine times out of 10, when people come to me looking for help with worry or worrying, they kind of feel like it's this automatic thing that they can't control. Um, And I think a lot of people put off even seeking therapy in the first place because they just assume that yeah, this is just how I am. Hey, there's nothing that can be done with it. You know, my, my brain works the way that it does and kind of that's it. And I, I always try to make this distinction that, you know, automatic is not the same as inevitable. Um, and so, yes, it may be that your worrying has become so habitual and so automatic that it happens without even thinking about it. But that doesn't mean you can't become more intentional and learn how to do something different with it. And so the I think the example that I give in the book, if I remember correctly, is uh, something to the effect of, you know, like when I get dressed in the morning, I put on my right pant leg first. And I don't think about it. I just do it. I'm getting dressed. It's kind of, you know, this autopilot sort of experience. But if I wanted to put on my left pant leg first, I certainly could, you know, it might take some reminders, I might have to build up awareness of that, that whole process, right? Like it, it would take this intentionality and really deliberate effort, but it absolutely can be done. Um, and so I, I think I, 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 I know in the book and just in general, when I'm working with clients, I, I work really hard at kind of breaking down that, that myth of worrying as this sort of inevitable thing that we just have to deal with. Yeah. What, what tips do you have for clients who, you know, want to have more of that intentional thought process behind their worrying? And like, how do you start to be more self-aware that, the difference between worry and worrying? Yeah. So, you know, I think you have to slow it down a bit. And so, yeah, I think there are a couple of parts of that. So I think one is just kind of building awareness, you know, like the getting dressed kind of thing. It's like, well, I would have to be very intentional and saying, hey, I'm going to get dressed. I'm going to get the shower. I'm going to get dressed. Like at that moment, I'm going to put a little post-it on my dresser or whatever, something like that, right? Like that I, I would have to really start to tune into those moments where it's happening. And I think with worrying, I think we need to do a similar thing. And I appreciate it's not quite as, I don't know, tangible as getting dressed in the morning, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's a little bit different, but I think for most people, there are these spots, you know, whether it's getting in bed at the end of the day or driving in their car or when a particular thing happens in their day, you know, they get an email from their boss, that that kind of thing, right? Like that, I think there often are these moments where we can, kind of plan accordingly. Mm -hmm. And I, one of my pet peeves is when people say like, oh, like just stop, right? Like just stop worrying. It's like, yeah, sure. I I would have done that if I could. Obviously. Um, (laughs) Yeah. And and I think what's kind of missed there is, you know, we, we can't just snap our fingers and become a different person. And so I think if we're trying to, to build this skill really intentionally, 
we really have to focus on these more kind of succinct time periods, right? So like saying to someone, hey, don't worry today, that's not going to work. But saying to someone, hey, on your way to work, when you're driving for those 15 minutes, here's what I want you to practice. And I think just having that that really time-specific little chunk, I think, can can make it much more attainable. So I think we have to kind of start there and figuring out, hey, where are the spots where we're going to start practicing this stuff and really trying to build that skill? But then I think we also need to kind of, st- you know, to get a feel for where where it is just this this thought, this thing that entered our awareness and where it starts to kind of bleed into something that, that is becoming more intentional. And so I, I, I know in the book, I, I think I kind of belabor this point because I think it's really important, but I, I spent a lot of time talking about sort of awareness versus like attention or focus and then engagement with a thought. And so I, I think, you know, for all of us, our kind of internal experience. It's so unique. It's our own little thing. It's our own little private event that we get to have for ourselves. And I think as a result, we often don't name those experiences. We're just like, oh yeah, this is me. This is how my mm-hmm. my mind works. And so I, I think it is important to be able to pick apart, hey, here's awareness. It's all the stuff that you just kind of noticed in the moment. And then there's attention. You know, it's you shining your spotlight on one particular little subset of things and then there's engagement with it. So it's not just shining the flashlight or a spotlight, but it's kind of, again, picking it up and examining it, starting to do something with it. And I, I think I think for most people, when you first start doing this, you're probably going to notice it after you cross the line. And I mm-hmm. think this is, is how it goes when we're trying to draw a firm line that, you know, I think it becomes clearer and clearer the further you get past that line. And that's fine. You know, I think there's still something to learn there. I think we can still catch it in that moment and and bring ourselves back to the present moment. We can kind of disengage from that thought. But yeah, I think it just takes a lot of practice and repetition. And again, I think for that reason, I think it helps to to really practice those skills in these more time limited kind of chunks. Yeah, I uh, I found your book really helpful. Just on a personal note, reading it at this time in my life because uh, I mentioned to you before that I went through cancer treatment, which is worrying central. Um, and I was trying to figure out how to not actively engage in the worry now that I'm, you know, in remission, like, because I could spend the rest of my life worrying it's going to come back or worrying for what's ahead. So I, I, I think I found your book at a perfect time prepping for this, this conversation, because it really helped to know, know the difference, right? Like there is, and, and this is one thing I wanted to ask too. I want you to talk about helpful versus unhelpful worry, because I yeah. think like you could probably agree, there is some helpful worry there with like a sickness or any sort of illness, but when it's taking over your life, you know, where does that get you? Yeah. Yeah. And I agree. And I think that's like, <laughs> it's like the million dollar question mm-hmm. is like, yeah, how do we, how do we draw that line? And yeah, I, I think as with many of those lines, it's super clear once we're way past it. And uh, yeah, I think trying to draw it is a little trickier. Mm -hmm. I always want to distinguish between the two. And I think, you know, helpful versus unhelpful, I think is a good, I think is a good label for it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, in fact, in general, when I'm talking about worrying, I I do a lot of work with OCD. And so there we're often talking about kind of mental compulsions. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I think some people use rumination or overanalysis. You know, there's a million different kind of phrases we can throw at this sort of phenomenon. I think unhelpful thinking is is sort of my preferred way of thinking about that, right? Like that it's, I I think really cuts to the core of, hey, thinking isn't bad. It's, It's a really helpful thing. It can be a great strategy. But I think we need to kind of harness that and make sure that it stays in this place where it's kind of functional and useful. And so, yeah, I think something like health anxiety, and again, I think the cancer example, I think is a, a really good one, right? It's like there, it's not just a hypothetical, like, mm-hmm. hey, I I might get sick someday. It's like, no, I have this thing that I'm dealing with and it's like really scary. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think it's a, a good example in that sense. And so- I think a, a thing that I often point out is I would say worrying almost by definition is unhelpful. Just in that, I, I think we want to distinguish between that and something like problem solving or planning or right. Like again, these are can still be these kind of mental activities that we do. But I, I think it's that line between something that is useful and is actually impacting the future in some way. It's changing the results 
versus something that where we're just now kind of spinning our gears and we're, we're churning. Um, and so it's just think about that example of like, oh, like I can't, I can't know what the future is going to hold. Will it come back? Right. Like that's a scary thought for sure. But I think we can stick with like, well, like what are the things that I can do? You know, I, I'm, I, I, we don't need to delve into it, but like, yeah, like no, I, yeah. <laughs> I imagine you probably have been given some instructions from some doctors around like, Hey, here's what, what this looks like. Yeah. I don't know. Check in every year or every mm-hmm. six months or whatever. Right. Like there, there are these things that you can be doing. And then there's these other things that are just not going to change the outcome at all. Uh, and so the, uh, I know the example I give in my book is uh, like studying for a test. You know, if you have a test coming up on Friday, you really, really want to do well. Are you going to be better served worrying about that test or studying for the test? And obviously the answer is studying. And I think it just for me drives home that point of, well, studying, this is actual preparation and planning. You're doing something that hopefully if you're doing it well, will change the results, right? Mm-hmm. Like it'll change the outcome in some way. Worrying, if anything, it's going to change the results in, in a negative way. You're going to go in there right. with a bunch of anticipatory anxiety. Um, so yeah, I, I think, again, in my mind, it's just this that point of diminishing returns, the place where it stops being helpful and now just becomes this sort of repetitive process. Yeah. I'm going to be honest with you, Ben. I was that kid in high school who, one, overachiever, but I would just yeah. tell myself I was going to fail the test, like just mm. like knock myself down mentally and then be nicely surprised. <laughs> yeah. Like I would still prep yeah. and it do everything, but I'd be like, it's yeah. going to go badly for me <laughs> and it would always go fine. But <laughs> yeah. what does it takes the pressure off a little bit? And, you know, I, I'm always a fan of being nice to ourselves yes. and being positive and optimistic and all those things. But I think there's something to I, I think about that sometimes, like when I'm giving talks at conferences, that kind of thing, where I think when I first started doing that. I would often go into it saying like, oh, like, don't be anxious, right? Like you got to, got to be really cool and calm yeah. and blah, blah, blah. And I think I've more recently have said like, no, of course you're going to be anxious, right? Like, yeah, that's, that's fine. Like go into it expecting anxiety and you know, it, it's there. It kind of dissipates over time. It's, it's kind of fine. But I, I think in doing that, you, you kind of remove some of that anticipation, you know, that it's yeah. no longer this thing that you're trying to prevent. And instead it's a thing you've sort of accepted. And yeah, I think that makes a big difference. I like that shift, though, what you said of like expecting the anxiety versus expecting a terrible outcome. Like, I think that's mm, the yeah. the difference you offer there, because I also struggled this with this during like my cancer journey, because I had a what they called a special case, which no one wants to hear. So I had like a lot of yeah. letdowns. And so at some point, like as I was getting toward the end of chemo prepping for my surgery, I grappled a lot with feeling scared to be hopeful versus yeah. like letting myself know it's okay to be hopeful, but it's also okay to be anxious. So I like that slight shift that you're offering. Cause I, I feel like a lot of people can relate to that, like expecting the worst. Yeah. I think it's one of those sort of, I don't know, maybe an underrated isn't quite the right word, but like maybe underappreciated parts of anxiety is that I think so often our beliefs about anxiety are a huge part of that experience. And so I think when people have that belief of, I can't handle anxiety, it's going to be catastrophic, right? Like I should be able to control it. You know, I think a lot of those kind of beliefs, like they really change the experience of anxiety itself. Mm -hmm. And so I I think, I think the thing that I'm always hopeful for with clients is that they emerge from therapy. You know, I'm not a jerk. I hope they have less anxiety Mm -hmm. for sure. But what I really want is that they come away from it just feeling capable of being anxious that it, it we kind of remove that taboo and that that kind of element of it where it's this thing that must not be felt and we can kind yeah. of go into it saying like yeah I, I got it I know what it's like to be anxious I can do it I feel confident in my ability to have that experience and and I, I think we could substitute in there these other challenging emotion like disappointment or mm-hmm. like yeah sadness right like just that idea of like hey I do I ever want to feel disappointed no of course not but but that's the thing that I'm, I'm familiar with. I can do it. I can handle it. I'll get through it. Yeah, absolutely. And in your book, you talk about how there's different types of worry. Could you talk a little bit about what some of those different types are? Yeah. And so, you know, I think I want to be kind of careful here and saying like, you know, I think all these different categories, you know, I think they're helpful sometimes in, in kind of, you know, just getting a feel for our own little unique brand of worrying 
But, you know, the categories, they're kind of arbitrary. You know, I think a lot of people find that their experience could probably fall into a couple of different categories. You know, so I think, uh, I guess that's just my disclaimer of, you know, these categories aren't perfect. But I think some people do lean more towards one variation of worry rather than another. And so, you know, I think for some people, worry tends to be really focused on the past. And so that might look like this kind of mental review of things that they've done. You know, I think the classic is like mentally reviewing a social interaction or a job interview, that kind of thing. You know, the the thing that I say that was so stupid, I should have said something else. And, you know, I think that kind of, you know, that hindsight awareness going back and just picking ourselves apart for all these little minor flaws. You know, I think that also that mental review, I think for some people can look more like a mental checking, right? Like just wanting to, and this comes up a lot with OCD, but I think that can be for anyone, it's not just OCD, but again, just kind of delving into the past to try to be sure, again, that I did the right thing, that I, I didn't do something wrong, I didn't forget something. So I think for a lot of people, it's kind of past focused. For some people, it's future focused. Um, and I think that usually looks like either this kind of like running mental simulations, you know, that I think there are, you know, from this point, this moment right here, we can look into the future and imagine this infinite number of possibilities of these different ways that our lives can go. And it's really tempting to just run through all those different simulations and try to find the optimal course for our lives. Unfortunately, we can't see the future. It's like, you know, I think that one for me is that one hits that point of diminishing returns pretty quickly. But I I guess maybe I'll, I'll just point out here that I, I think both of those things, either the mental review or that kind of simulating the future there's something helpful in both of them, you know? So if I come out of that job interview and I, I don't know, I like flubbed one of the questions, I can say like, all right, like that didn't go well. Like, what can I learn? I can make an adjustment for next time, right? Like mental review is not always bad. It just, it hits a point of diminishing returns at some point where there's nothing left to learn. I also think there's this bias there because I think we uh, sometimes will pick out things that went wrong just because we have the advantage of hindsight. But that doesn't mean we did something wrong, right? Like sometimes, I don't know, like you make a mistake and there's not really anything to learn. Like you got unlucky or it was a mistake that could not reasonably have been prevented. And so I think it's, again, I think we we want to look back at these things and find what's helpful, but I think we want to kind of draw that line when yeah. there's not, not really anything to learn from it. And I think similarly with kind of running those simulations about the future, you know, hey, if we're making a decision, it's not unreasonable to imagine this kind of branching off of like, hey, here are the pros and cons of one decision. Here are the pros and cons of another decision. Which one do I want to choose? Right? Like that can be really helpful. I think we often get stuck in that though. And I I think this is, again, nine times out of 10, when I talk to clients, I'm like, oh yeah, like what do you need to make a decision? And the answer is kind of, well, nothing. I, I've already sized up all of the pros and cons. I know what it all looks like. I just haven't pulled the trigger on it. Mm-hmm. I'm just going, churning through this over and over again, you know, picking apart the pros and cons of these different things without actually taking that next step to take action. Um, so again, I, I think there are positive things here. There are, there are things that are helpful, but there's just some point where it, it stops being useful. So I, I, again, I think that for most people, worry tends to be either past focused or future focused. You know, I think there are a lot of people who just get stuck in this sort of hyper awareness of things, right? Like that they're, they just have more active minds. They're dealing with more thoughts that are getting thrown at them and they're, they just keep noticing things. And so I I think there are people who get really stuck on, Hey, here's this decision. I I'm going to turn this one thing over a thousand times and spend hours doing it. I think there are other people who, ping, ping around from one thing to another. And it, it's not so much I've delved into one thing, but more, again, my mind's just throwing a lot of stuff at me. I wanted to get your opinion because this was something um, that came up with a different author a couple seasons ago that really resonated with me. Uh, they were talking about how a lack of anxiety in a moment can also create anxiety. So like, if I'm not worrying at the current moment, then I'm worrying that there's nothing to worry about. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I think that hap- I think that happens a lot. And so I for me, I think there are a couple of pieces of that. So I think one is just that kind of, I don't know, the that Pavlovian kind of thing of like, hey, these things have been associated in one way or another. So worrying and things going okay, things being safe. You know, and I, I 
I think there, for many people, going back to like our beliefs about worry, I think one of the beliefs that often perpetuates worry is the belief that worrying is helpful. You know, this is how I keep myself safe. This is how I prevent bad things from happening. And I think I, I think people can become really entrenched in those beliefs. And I, I think about the studying versus worrying kind of thing. You know, sometimes people worry and they study. They do it all the same day. And kind of like what <laughs> sort of what you described, yeah. right? Like, yeah. I, and then things go well. And so like, I think it, it creates this situation where it's, potentially getting reinforced, you know, oh, I, I worried and I got an A, that must mean that worrying was helpful. And it's, I, I think we're missing like, no, there's another variable there that we're not accounting for. You studied or you actually knew this material really well, or like there, there's something else there. Worrying wasn't actually the thing that was helpful, but when you throw it in the mix, it, it's hard to kind of uh, account for that. So yeah, I think a lot of people just come to associate worrying with, hey, I'm, I'm protecting myself. This is how I'm safe. And so in those moments where it's not there, it's kind of jarring. And I'll say this comes up a lot with OCD treatment, you know, when, and I, I would guess I'd say this of any kind of like exposure based treatment where people start to kind of habituate to an exposure. So if you have, um, I don't know, a fear of dogs or with OCD, right? Like, yeah, if you're worried, I'm going to get sick from touching that doorknob or whatever, um, you know, and then you start doing exposure, you go through treatment. Eventually these things are not eliciting quite as much anxiety and I think for many people, there's that moment of like, oh, crap, like I, I'm supposed to be paying attention to this. Like something is wrong. If I have just waltzed through life without worrying about these things, I'm being negligent and something is mm -hmm. going to go really wrong. So, yeah, I, I think it it takes some time, I think, to kind of break that association, you know, get to that. And this is what I, I think is sort of the at the crux of a lot of exposure based treatment is we're trying to to essentially just break that association. We're trying to remove these, these extraneous variables. So if you think about that, like touching a doorknob kind of idea, you know, if you touch that doorknob and then go wash your hands, all that your brain learns is you're safe because you washed your hands. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you remove that hand wash, now you can touch the doorknob, you don't get sick and you can say, oh yeah, I guess the doorknob wasn't that dangerous in the first place. Um, and so I think this is kind of what we're trying to get to essentially, whether that's OCD or just anxiety and worry in general, we're trying to remove these extra variables so that we can learn, actually, I'm, I'm okay. I can make it through the world without turning this over in my head a thousand times. It's going to be okay. We'll be right back after this short break. I'm Dr. Lindsay Gibson. Growing up with emotionally immature parents, can affect their adult children in several ways. Most of all, it affects the child's ability to trust themselves as adults and to see themselves as people of value who have healthy entitlements to respect and their own individuality. So join me on this adventure of self-discovery. For more details, go to adultchildrencourse.com. One thing, one thing I struggle with personally is like one, because of where I work, I read a lot of mental health books. I feel, yeah. I feel very self-aware of my own mental health, but how, how do you work through when you know something is like, you know, the logical truth of something, but you still can't help to not have that worry cycle going in the background. Yeah. I think it's one of the most frustrating things about anxiety is like <laughs> places where logic and reasoning just don't really work. Um, and I, I, the like prime example of that for me is flying, which is like one of the safest things we can do. And yet lots of people feel really scared flying yeah. and people often say to themselves, Oh, well, you know, you're more likely to die on the way to the airport or whatever. Like that we know all these statistics. Mm -hmm. It's not that we don't know it. It's just that we don't, for most people, you don't fly often enough to kind of work through that that anxiety. And so I, I always think it's notable that, you know, if you're up on a plane, you're going through turbulence, everyone's kind of grabbing their armrests. And meanwhile, the flight attendants, they're just, they're passing out their peanuts. They don't care. Um, and it's not that they know something we don't know. It's just that they've had different experiences than we have. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when I give talks, I have a slide on, on this and it's a picture of me skydiving actually. Mm. Um, and I, there's this look, on, I'm like, I have a look of sheer terror on my face. I'm like mouth wide open and screaming. And you can see the, you know, the professional skydiver strapped to my back. The look on his face is like, he has this like, 
he's like bored or <laughs> maybe like annoyed by me screaming. Right, like he's just like kind of like tuned out. And so I, I always think about that picture as like this perfect juxtaposition of like we don't know. He doesn't know anything that I don't know. He's just jumped out of a plane a bunch of times, mm-hmm. and I have not. And so yeah, we have these different reactions. And so I, I think I think it's important for us not to be mean to ourselves in these moments. Anxiety is not logical or rational Mm -hmm. for any of us, right? Like it it really, it's about experience. It's about what we've done. Um, We can get really comfortable doing reckless stuff, right? Like, like it, it's not really about safety and risk. It's really just about experience. Mm -hmm. Um, And at the same time, we can feel really scared doing things that are totally safe. Yeah. I think we just want to be kind to ourselves. It's okay if it doesn't make sense. It doesn't really for any of us. And yeah, I think it's really just that reminder of, hey, you can't just convince yourself to not be anxious. You have to go out and do it and live a life that will kind of provide that experiential learning that we need to to feel differently in those moments. Definitely. Earlier, you mentioned that when you see clients, a lot of them just think this worry is inevitable, that it just is how it works for them. What are some of the common reasons that you hear in your practice of people sort of talking about this inevitableness of worrying? Yeah, I think for many people, it's born out of this very real experience of, hey, this is all I've ever known. And so, well, yeah, why would I expect something different? And I appreciate that. Like, I think that that checks out to me. You're like, hey, if that's that's been your entire life, it makes sense that you would conclude, hey, this is just how it is. But I also think a lot of people, even though we kind of know that it doesn't make sense, I think a lot of people approach it with that just stop kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. Um, And people don't want to chip away at it and do this more gradual skill building kind of process. And I I personally, I see a lot of perfectionism there. Um, And I think it's similar to kind of like the Oh, I don't know. I've never been able to build a regular exercise habit. But meanwhile, the only thing you've ever done is that like all in New Year's resolution kind of pr- approach, mm-hmm. which inevitably fails because it's not sustainable. I also think, and I think I give this example in the book as well, but I I think people often just kind of, there's this all or nothingness to that. Maybe that kind of goes with perfectionism, but that idea of like, hey, I will never be someone who's worry-free. I'm not going to be that like chill laid back person. So why bother? And I, I would say like, yeah, maybe like, yeah, maybe that's not you. That That's okay. But that doesn't mean you can't get better at it. And I think the example I use in the book is like, I am a five, seven middle-aged. Like I, I suspect that my chances of becoming Michael Jordan <laughs> are, my, my, they're waning, right? Like that. I, I think that window is closing. Um, <laughs> But that doesn't mean I can't get better at basketball, right? And I I am sure if I go out and practice playing basketball every day, I will get better. Am I going to be Michael Jordan? I don't think so. But I think that doesn't mean I shouldn't try and that doesn't mean I can't improve and build that skill. And so, yeah, I think I think for a lot of people that they, they've lived with it their whole lives, they've tried in this kind of all or nothing way and it's failed and they see these attempts at gradual improvement as being, I don't know, not worth it or right. Like they just, they haven't given it a go in that more sustainable way. Um, So yeah, I, again, I I think that all makes sense. I see why people come away with that conclusion, but I do think, obviously I wrote a book about it. I do think there's another, another way to do that. I think it can be done. I think it just means approaching it in a different way. Yeah. I'm breaking that all or nothing mindset. Yeah. One thing you write in the book that really stuck out to me is that the actual content of the worry isn't what is important. Can you say more about that? Yeah. I mean, I think it's overemphasized, Mm -hmm. right? And like, I I think when we focus on content, um, I think we often miss the process, right? And like, I I think ultimately the process is the thing that we want to be focused on here because that's, that's how we make changes. That's how we kind of adjust how we are approaching things. But I also think when we're focused on content, I think it's really easy to kind of like, I don't know, uh, like invalidate ourselves in some ways. So I think people often either 
they're worried about insignificant things and then they just give themselves a bunch of crap for being worried about something that's, you know, there are children starving somewhere. How could I be worried about, I don't know, my job or, Mm -hmm. you know, things like that. And so, yeah, I think often the result of that is just invalidating ourselves. And then I think even in these places where like there is this more significant thing that we're worried about, I think it then just kind of gives credence to worrying. It's like, oh, well, this is important. So I should be worried about it. And so like either way, it's pretty unhelpful. So yeah, I I think, and this is maybe why I, I prefer kind of defining this around just effectiveness and is it useful? Is it is it helpful? Um, because I think that cuts more to the core of what we're talking about. And so, yeah, I think it could be a really important thing. It could be a really unimportant thing. That's not as useful as figuring out, hey, the way that I'm relating to this, the way I'm dealing with that, is that actually an effective approach or not? Yeah. So as we're starting to sort of break down that process of worry, what are some helpful ways to start to unhook from those thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. So I think this is, I think where you have to practice a bunch of stuff. And so I think as with anything, I think you have to start with that awareness building piece that we had talked about earlier right? Like you have to, if you want to try to do something differently, you know, in the moment when you're worrying, you want to try a different technique, you want to use some skill, you have to be aware of it first, right? So I think it all starts there. But then, yeah, I think from there, I think we have a a range of different things that we can do. Um, And I think they're all probably going to depend to some degree on on your own kind of brand of worry, right? Like what, what is it that's keeping you hooked in there? And then we can kind of tailor our intervention accordingly. So just some examples, you know, I I think, I know we had talked about one already, which is, you know, those beliefs about worry. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think, I think getting clear on, Hey, are these beliefs perpetuating worry? Are they not right? Like what, what are, how are my beliefs shaping this experience? And so I think, I think that's one point of intervention is we can say, okay, in these moments where I find myself pulled towards worrying I'm going to give myself this reminder of, hey, I actually want to stick with something more like problem solving. So in this moment, I'm going to figure out what problem solving looks like. I'm going to figure out the the most optimal way of doing that. And then I'm going to leave it there and go on to doing something else. And so I, I think just getting clear on, hey, how do I actually want to be approaching this? I think another one is just kind of fusion with our thoughts. So I think for many people, you know, Again, our thoughts kind of color our internal experience. And I think it's really easy to get kind of wrapped up in that where thoughts become reality in some ways. And I think practicing that skill of sort of, we call it cognitive diffusion, but essentially kind of building ourselves a little bit of distance from thoughts, being able to see a thought as a thought rather than this kind of unquestionable reality that we're Mm -hmm. experiencing I think that's really helpful. And, you know, there are lots of different exercises you can do to practice doing that. You know, I think at its most basic, it's it's really just acknowledging that it's a thought, which it sounds so simple, but it actually makes a huge difference for a lot of people. So, you know, when I'm, I don't know, waltzing along, maybe I go on a podcast and I have the thought, I'm a failure, right? So a lot of people are like, oh, like I I have this thought, I'm a failure. They start feeling, uh, I don't know, all sorts of different things. They're sad, they're ashamed. There's all this stuff coming up. And I think just that simple statement of, I notice I'm having the thought that I'm a failure Mm -hmm. as opposed to just, I'm a failure, right? And so I think a lot of people, that inner monologue, it just shows up. Like that thing gets thrown at you. it's, It's kind of overwhelming and scary, and I think just that distance of, I notice I'm having the thought that blank. I think that that makes a huge difference, right? It kind of puts it in perspective. There's a lot of these different exercises. Some people like to say it out loud. Some people like to sing the thought to, you know, the tune of happy birthday. You can say it in a Daffy Duck voice or Arnold Schwarzenegger or whatever. But again, all these things I think are just meant to, in this moment, bring your awareness to, I'm having a thought right now. And that thought does not need to dictate what comes next. It's just a thought. um, And I can kind of keep it at arm's length. I really like these kinds of exercises because I think they also foster some degree of acceptance, you know, that they're, we're not pushing the thoughts away. We're not trying to suppress them, right? Like that we we don't need to do anything with them. We can just notice them. And so I I think just saying, Hey, I'm having this thought. I see it here. I'm going to bring my attention back to the thing that I'm trying to do, but you know, thank you brain for that thought. I see it. I appreciate it. But that's not really what I'm trying to do right now. And so, yeah, I think it, 
I, I think it, in my mind, kind of facilitates a much more peaceful coexistence with those thoughts instead of kind of being at war with them. Yeah, it like takes the power away from them. It does. Yeah, I, and I, I think, you know, I think that idea of thought suppression of trying to push thoughts away. It's so tempting. We all like, we don't want the thoughts. They're uncomfortable. I, I, again, totally get why people do this, but you know, I, I, the kind of visual that always helps me is like, it's like trying to push a beach ball under the water where it's like, you can kind of do it for a little bit. It takes a bunch of energy and effort, but the second you let go, it comes flying back up again. And so, yeah, I think as tempting as it is, we just want to kind of let it be there. Let the ball float on the surface of the water maybe you didn't want to play with a beach ball that's fine but it's there and yeah you're going to carry on and just let it be there there are a million different things that we can do in these moments to disengage you know i think another one that i really like to do just because i think it helps people to kind of see that this is a a skill and it's kind of like building a muscle where it's like yeah you just have to do the exercises and practice and you'll get better at it but i think these kind of like elements of attention training where we just like very literally just practice putting our focus where we want to put it. Mindfulness and meditation, I think are really helpful here. I know some people kind of bristle at those, those words, they've become kind of therapy buzzwords. And uh, I sometimes like, like that, that label of attention training a little bit more, even that I think it's a very similar idea. But I think it, I think for me really gets to that idea of like, no, we're, we're building this attention muscle. And I, so I, I think one exercise I have people do is just to practice moving their attention around in these different ways. And so I think one of those can be just to place our focus on something, you know, just to try try to stay focused on one thing, could be anything. Um, I think another is to have that more open attention where we're just noticing kind of whatever comes in. Um, we're not trying to control it. We're not trying to change it. We're just being aware of whatever floats into our awareness. And then the third one is, is, I call it kind of like attention speed dating, where we're like trying to move it around to a bunch of different things. So it's like kind of like that first one, but rather than just staying focused on one thing, we're now pivoting. So instead of saying, hey, I'm going to focus on, I don't know, the sound of the birds outside, I'm going to focus on the birds and then I'm going to focus on the feeling in my seat and I'm going to focus on the taste in my mouth and then I'm going to focus on whatever thought just showed up in my mind, you know, just kind of moving it around. And I, I think we're really just trying to get this feeling of like command over these things, you know, that we, we can pivot that spotlight around and like, we actually do have control of it. I think it's really tricky. So like awareness is this thing that just happens. You know, if I hear the birds outside, I didn't necessarily choose to do that. It just kind of happens. Um, I think attention is tricky because it's partly intentional and partly unintentional. So like in that moment where I hear the birds outside, my attention might go to that, even though I, didn't intend to, but that doesn't mean I can't now bring it back to something else. And so like, I think that aspect of it where it's partly intentional, partly unintentional, I think gets really tricky for people. Yeah. But yeah, I think we just want to build that skill of saying like, yeah, sure. Your attention may get pulled to other things. That's fine. We can bring it back in this way where we're kind of gently shifting our attention back rather than again, trying to suppress it or push it away. I also, I know an exercise from the book that I know has seems to have really resonated with people uh, I call like the sock penny thing where I, I encourage people to put a penny in their sock. Could be any, it could be whatever, cotton ball or whatever. You, you put something that's mildly uncomfortable in your sock. And I think the goal here is really the same, right? Like it's, it's to notice this thing, which is kind of annoying. You're going to have that urge to try to stop noticing it. And we're going to kind of just practice bringing our attention back to the present moment, doing whatever it is we want to do. I, always think of it kind of like a mosquito bite where like if you get a mosquito bite, it's itchy. If you sit there and focus on it, it's going to be worse. If you try not to think about it, it's going to be worse. Really the only way we navigate that is just by kind of forgetting and like going about our lives. And like we eventually get engaged enough in what we're doing that we forget about it, even though the mosquito bite's still there. Um, And periodically through our day, our attention will drift back to it. It'll feel itchy again. And then eventually it'll just recede to the background. And I, I think that's kind of what we're without being a sadistic monster who has people intentionally get mosquito bites. (laughs) I think the sock penny is is kind of the substitute for that saying like, Hey, here's the thing that's kind of annoying. Your job is really just to like get engaged in living your life and allow it to recede to the background rather than forcing it to the background. I really like that reframing of mindfulness because I think 
it has become such a buzzword and it, it doesn't say a lot, right? Like the word itself, but when you make it an actionable thing, it totally like breaks down and makes it something that feels easy to digest. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I, you know, I think and this is probably true of most therapists. Like, I think that that feels right for me, right? Like, again, I know I personally, I, I really struggled with like compassion focused therapy and self-compassion and like, I love them so much but there's something that's so sweet and nice about them that I just kind of like bristle at it. And so, yeah, I think like I, I've needed things. I, I now I'm a hundred percent on board. I really love bringing self-compassion into the work that I do, but I think it's taken me a while just because like at, at first glance, it feels, I don't know. Like light. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think it's helped me and I, I think it helps for my clients as well, just to yeah have another way of conceptualizing that. Yeah. And Ben, as we start to wrap up, can you talk about what the characteristics of a non-worrier are? Yeah. You know, I, I wanted to include this in my book because I spend the whole thing talking about <laughs> worrying. And so like, <laughs> you know, I think I often find, and I, I think I've kind of borrowed from, you know, I've thought about kind of parenting my kids where you don't want to just tell them what not to do. You want to like give, tell them what they can do. Mm-hmm. So rather like, whatever, don't be mean to your sister. You want to say like, oh, like, here's how you can talk to your sister, right? Like that I I think just having something, not just positive, but like something to do rather than something not to do, I think is helpful. So yeah, I mean, I think the characteristics of a non-worrier, for me, it really boils down to like, we have to challenge that perfectionism. I do want to throw out the disclaimer of some people are, are just, that's the brain they got, right? Like that, I, I, I don't mean yeah. to imply that everyone who's, who's not worrying, like, oh, they've mastered all these skills and they've been so intentional. Like, no, like a lot of them just got lucky with whatever brains they have. But I think for people who don't have that brain, for people who are born, yeah, more primed for worry, who have brains that are a bit more active, yeah, we need to do this a little bit more intentionally. And yeah, I think I talk a lot about kind of growth mindset, which I think is another one of those kind of buzzwords that I uh, people may kind of bristle at. But I I think just that idea of like, hey, we we need to be able to be nice to ourselves. We need to be able to believe in that possibility for growth and for learning. And so I, I think that idea of growth mindset of like, hey, if you if you have a fixed mindset, you believe, hey, I am how I am. This is just the way it is. Whatever skills and abilities I have, they're fixed. That's it then you're much more likely if in those moments where you face failure, where you're imperfect, where you mess something up, your conclusion is going to be, oh, I messed that up because I suck, right? Like there is something wrong with me. I blew it. Like this is uh, this like referendum on me as a human being. Whereas with growth mindset, when you mess up and you can acknowledge that possibility for growth, that mess up is not, oh, I'm terrible. It's like, oh, I haven't learned this skill yet. So yeah, I, I think... When you have that growth mindset, it allows you to kind of interpret those imperfections in a very different way. I know one of the examples that I gave in the book is this guy who's a surgeon and had to kind of grapple with this idea of like, hey, becoming a surgeon involves practicing surgery without knowing what you're doing. I mean, to some degree, obviously, yeah. you know, you've gone to medical <laughs> school and blah, blah, blah. Like, there is a first time you cut open another human being. Like there's this very real risk there. And like, I I think it it talks a lot about kind of just his grappling with that of like, that feels awful that like there are, are people being subjected to my learning as a surgeon. And yet there's no way around it. Like Mm -hmm. if if we don't have that, say goodbye to surgeons, right? Like we, like there there is no way around that. And it's just this thing that we have to accept. And I, I really appreciated it. Like on that kind of scale where it's literally life or death. Yeah. And even there having to say, yeah, like this isn't perfect. This is the process. Everybody has to start as a novice and you grow and you get better. Doesn't make the screw ups not painful. Like Mm -hmm. I, of course that's painful and hard. But I I think just that acceptance of, hey, this is part of life. This is how we do it. And uh, yeah, I think if if we can do that with literal life or death, then yeah, I think we can do it when, yeah, I'm a crappy basketball player, right? Like that's like, I, I think we can do it there too. 
Yeah, that feels yeah. really powerful. That feels like a good place to wrap up unless you have any final thoughts for the listeners. My takeaway, my final thought, I think would be kind of circling back to something we talked about before, which is just, yeah, having that patience to chip away at this thing, you know, that I, I think so many people don't take those steps to get better because it feels insurmountable. And I think I think when you approach it in that all or nothing way, it is insurmountable, right? It, it can't really be done that way. But I think when you have that patience to chip away at it, to kind of, you know, build this toolbox of different things that you can do, it'll make it better. Even if it doesn't make you totally chill, it can make you <laughs> feel like you have a better handle on worry and where it shows up in your life. Yeah. Thanks so much. And thank you for your book. Like I, like I mentioned, I got a lot out of it, especially the timing that I read the thank whole you. thing. Thank you for your work on this and just making it feel really digestible to take on. And it, it doesn't make it sound hard. It's like, here are some actionable steps. And I really appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Worry happens. Worrying is optional. We live in an increasingly uncertain world, and if you struggle with worry, you aren't alone. You should also know that there's nothing wrong with worry. Worry happens to all of us, and it can even be helpful at times. But excessive worrying, the kind that keeps us up at night, interferes with our thinking during the day, and hijacks our ability to make decisions is a big, big problem. The good news is that, while worry is inevitable, worrying is completely optional. This book will show you how to break free from the unhelpful thinking habits that keep you stuck in a loop of rumination and anxiety. With help from this upbeat guide, you'll learn to build your own customizable anti-worrying toolbox using skills and strategies from metacognitive therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, and cognitive behavioral therapy. You'll discover the science behind why you worry and how to put the brakes on unhelpful rumination and anxious thoughts before they kick your worry and anxiety into high gear. With this go-to guide, you will gain a better understanding of worry, learn why worry happens, know when to draw a line at disruptive worrying, challenge perfectionism, and accept uncertainty. There is no one-size-fits-all treatment for anxiety and worry, but by assembling an arsenal of tools, skills, and strategies, excessive worry can be managed effectively. This book will help you get started now. Visit our website at www.newharbinger.com and use coupon code PODCAST25 to receive 25% off your entire order. New Harbinger Publications is an independent, employee-owned publisher of books on psychology, health, spirituality, and personal growth. For over 50 years, our evidence-based self-help books and pioneering workbooks have helped readers make positive changes to improve mental health and well-being. Founded by psychologists Matthew McKay and Patrick Fanning, New Harbinger is proud to be an employee-owned company. Our books reflect our core values of integrity, sustainability, compassion, and trust. Written by leaders in the field and recommended by therapists worldwide, New Harbinger books are practical, accessible, and provide real tools for real change. Join the New Harbinger Clinicians Club, a free membership club exclusively for mental health professionals. Sign up today and you'll receive a special welcome gift, 35% off all professional books, free client resources, free eBooks throughout the year, access to private sales, a subscription to our quick tips for therapists, email program, and more. Visit newharbinger.com slash clinicians club for more information. Do you have an idea for another episode? Do you want to send us a message? Our email address is podcast at newharbinger.com. We'd love to hear from you. This podcast was edited by Jesse Fancushion. If you enjoyed today's episode, we'd love if you rated, reviewed, and subscribed to the show, and we hope that you might share it with anyone who could benefit from the content. This podcast is not a substitute for counseling with a licensed provider.